So starting with the frontal bone, remember the frontal bone is this large bone that typically forms your forehead. And remember on this skull, this suture in it, making two frontal bones is an anomaly. And usually the suture is, is replaced over time. So when we're looking at our frontal bone, we have a, a ridge that occurs above the eye on which our eyebrows sit. So it's called the superciliary arch. So it creates an arch above the eye, it's elevated, and your, your eyebrows look like a band of cilia, so if you remember that superciliary arch on both sides. When the superciliary arch comes together midline, just above your nose, it forms the gabella. And so our superciliary arches lead into the gabella. Now, if you're actually looking at the edge of the orbit of the eye, then this edge on the top of the orbit of the eye here is called the superior orbital margin. And notice in this skull, we have a depression in it here and a depression in it here. So this would be called the supraorbital notch. In some skulls, instead of a notch, we would actually see a hole. So if we look at this skull, notice that if, as we're following this margin around, we don't have a notch, but we actually have a little hole right here. So that would be called a superorbital foramen. And that highly varies in skulls from one skull to the next skull. Now the parietal bones themselves, we just have to know where they're located. So remember the parietal bones are, are lined to the anterior by the coronal suture inferiorly by the squamosal suture, posteriorly by the lambdoidal suture, and sagittally by the sagittal suture. So this is a parietal bone, so left and right parietal bones. Now as we turn the skull around, then the backbone is an occipital bone, and it's delineated by the lambdoidal suture superior. So as we're looking at the occipital bone, it contains the large hole in the inferior aspect of the occipital bone through which your spinal cord exits your skull. So it's referred to as a foramen magnum. Now as we're looking at the foramen magnum, we'll see two smooth surfaces on the anterior aspect of the foramen magnum. And they're elevated smooth surfaces, so they're called condyles. And so this is an occipital condyle. And the occipital condyles are going to articulate with the first cervical vertebrae to allow the, some of the movement that occurs in our neck. Now once we, find our, once we find our occipital condyles, if we look to the inside of them, there's actually a hole that you can see that the, the pointer is now passing through. And this hole is called the hypoglossal canal. So it gets its name because the nerve that exited here is going to go down to your tongue right here. And so, it's, and so glossal is a reference to your tongue. Now, as we look at the skull from its posterior aspect, then we'll see that there is a projection midline on the occipital bone. And that's called the ex external occipital protuberance midline. And when we find that, we'll notice there's a ridge going laterally from it on both sides. And this upper ridge is called the superior neutral lines. And then we find the lower ridge right here, which is the inferior neutral lines. Now those can look subtly different depending upon how rounded the skull is posteriorly. So when we look here, we'll notice that the, ox the external occipital protuberance is more pronounced than we were just looking at. So the superior neutral lines become very obvious. And then the inferior neutral lines here, again, are a little more subtle. Now, when we look at the temporal bone, then from the outside uh, orientation of the temporal bone, then on the flattened portion of the skull here, we call this the squamous portion of the temporal bone. And then this projection downward is the mastoid portion of the temporal bone. And then starting with this hole, and then underneath the skull here, we can see the petrous portion of the temporal bone. And as we look internal in the skull, this ridge that we're seeing right here is also the part of the petrous portion of the temporal bone. So as we look at the temporal bone, when we're looking at the squamous portion of the temporal bone, 
then this fine projection right here, which terminates at this suture right here, is called the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. And it helps form a, a arch here called the zygomatic arch that increases uh, bone surface for muscle attachment. As we look at the mastoid portion of the temporal bone, we have this enlargement that we see right here, which is called our mastoid process. And remember, this is hollow inside. So as we're looking at the external aspect of the temporal bone again, we're going to go back to this complete skull for a second. Then our, our landmark on the outside is this opening, which is our external auditory meatus. And once we find our external auditory meatus, if we rotate the skull a little bit, just in front of it, we have this depressed smooth area right here, which is called the mandibular fossa. And that's actually where the head of the mandible sits to create your temporal mandibular joint, uh, which allows your jaw to rotate. If we go back to this skull, what you can see is that the head of the mandible actually is sitting in a depression and that depression that we see, if I pull that out, is what we were just referring to, which is our mandibular fossa that the head of the mandible is now sliding back into. So as we turn the skull upside down, we'll notice that just next to where we were looking at our, our mandibular fossa, we have this very sharp projection that we can see laterally next to our mastoid process. So this is called the styloid process. Frequently, these get broken off, so we're just seeing this, the, the end of it on this side of the skull. And then we have a hole that exists between this process, the mastoid process, and this process, the styloid process. So when we look down in here, we see a hole down in here, which is the stylomastoid foramen. And the, one of the other things that we'll be able to see, which we talked about a little bit, is that as we look internally, we actually have a hole through which, through which the jugular vein flows. So the hole that we see internally here is called the jugular foramen. If I rotate the skull around and keep the probe in it, then you can see then you can see how the jugular foramen can see from the, be seen from the inferior aspect of the skull. Now, when you look from the inferior aspect of the skull, you'll notice that there's an impression of the blood vessel that we see right here. So, as you recall, when we did the inside of the skull, we were talking about the, the sigmoid sulcus that runs into a hole that we have down here, which is our jugular foramen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this pipe cleaner through the jugular foramen. And as I rotate the skull, you'll be able to see that the jugular foramen comes out the bottom of the skull here. And if you look closely where, the, where it's coming out, then there's an impression of the blood vessel that, uh, that it's sitting in right here, which we call the jugular fossa. So you can just see a rounded area that's associated with where the pipe cleaner is, which is our jugular fossa, which can only be seen externally. Now, if we move to the first hole anterior to where the pipe cleaner is, which is our jugular foramen, we will have a hole that we can see in the skull just next to it, which is our carotid canal. And so the two major blood vessels in your neck, the jugular vein and the carotid artery, pass in to and out of the skull via these holes. Now our last thing we're going to look at on our, on our temporal bone is something that's in line with this hole on the outside, which is our external auditory meatus. So if we rotate the skull to the inside, then we're going to notice that we have a hole directly in line with that on this ridge in the floor of the skull, and that's our internal auditory meatus, where our nerve coming from our inner ear apparatus uh, carries information toward our brain. So the next bone we're going to do is our sphenoid bone, so I wanted to review it with the colored skull again. So on the floor of the cranium, the sphenoid bone appears as a red butterfly.
From the side of the skull, we can see the sphenoid bone and the posterior aspect of the behind the orbit of the eye here. And then inferiorly, we can see the sphenoid bone on either side of our nasal passage. So when we're looking at the butterfly, then the butterfly, the center part of the butterfly is called the body of the butterfly. And this, play, this is hollow, so if we cut below it, we will see a, uh, we'll see a sinus again that we looked at earlier. Now, if I contrast that to a regular skull, then here's the butterfly that we're seeing in the floor of the cranium. And here's the body of the butterfly. That would be hollow. Now, the butterfly has wings. And so if I look at the part that we were seeing it's posterior to the orbit of the eye, then it's called the greater wing of the sphenoid. And if I try to touch that, what I would see on the inside of the skull is this depressed area here is the greater wing of the sphenoid. The ridge that we see anterior to that is the lesser wing of the sphenoid. And then the body itself contains an area that's, that's called the cella tersica. So this whole area that I'm outlining is the cella tersica. And the cella tersica is divided into this little groove that we see here going from one optic foramen to the next optic foramen on either side. So this groove is called a chiasmatic groove because that's where the uh, optic nerve is going to cross in the skull and the word chiasm is a reference to a cross. Just posterior to the chiasmatic groove we get this deep depression where your pituitary gland sets. So the high tech name for your pituitary gland is the hypothesis. And so this is referred to as the hypotheseal fossa. So if we take a, and look at the cella tersica still, and we take our, our pipe cleaner, then we'll be able to stick the pipe cleaner through the optic foramen. And as we rotate the skull around, then we can see that in the back of the orbit of the eye, we have a round hole through which the optic nerve passes, which is called the optic foramen. Now also, while we're looking in the eye, you'll notice that as I pull this away, that the hole we're just referring to and looking at was this optic foramen. As we look in the eye, lateral to the optic foramen is this opening that we see right here which is the superior orbital fissure. It actually intercedes with a one in the bottom of the eye that we call the inferior orbital fissure. As you can see, they create a V-like pattern that actually points toward the nose. So again, this larger opening is the superior orbital fissure.